Uh, welcome to today's HERN webinar. Really happy that you could join. We had a record number of, of folks sign up today, which is terrific, over 130. I'm Joyce Nyland. I'm the PI of what's called the HIREC. It's the Human Islet Research Enhancement Center, basically the coordinating center, along with my co-PI, John Cadiz, and our project manager, Layla Rouse. And today we're welcome and we're very glad to have Mike Brem from the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Dr. Brem is a member of one of our consortia called CMI, and I'll tell you about uh, what that stands for in just a minute. I'll give you a brief introduction to Hearn and his talk, and then we'll, we'll launch into Dr. Brem's talk. Next slide, please. So as an overview for today's webinar, <clears throat> we're going to give you first an introduction to what, what Hearn is, and then Dr. Dr. Brem's presentation in which he'll give you an overview of the history and applications of humanized mice in biomedical research, factors that you should consider for specific strain selection, models to study human beta cell function, human immune system engraftment parameters and limitations, and then an overview of T1D specific models. And then we'll save time at the end, hopefully for some discussion and Q&A. So as an introduction to HERN, which began in 2014, HERN is a network of what is now five consortia. Over on the left, CBDS stands for the Consortium on Beta Cell Death and Survival. CMI is the Consortium on Modeling Immune, Autoimmune Interactions, which Dr. Brem belongs uh, to that consortium. CHIB is the Consortium on Human Islet Biomimetics, <clears throat> developing things like an islet on a chip and other very interesting uh, features. CTAR is the Consortium on Targeting and Regeneration. And HPAC is the Human Pancreas Analysis Consortium, does deep dives into pancreatic uh, donations. And at the hub is HIREC. We are the Human Islet Research Enhancement Center, helping to coordinate these various consortia. Next, there are over 200 investigators, 80 institutions in nine countries participating. Um, the way you participate is to apply for a competitive HERN grant, and these opportunities arise now and then. Keep your eye out. We have a newsletter that anyone can sign up for with such announcements of RFAs to, to join HERN and other funding opportunities. Next. Um, you can also look at our research developments if you go to our HERN website, which is uh, given down at the bottom, hernnetwork.org, with just one N and go to reports. We've had four so far and we're working on the next executive summary that gives a, a really good overview of all the research and advances going on. And you can also see all of our publications on the, the HERN website as well. Next. And we do have a resource catalog that's available to anyone interested in diabetes okay. research. There are antibodies, mouse strains, cell lines, data sets, virus vectors, and protocols. And I want to show you the web page, and you can get to it uh, on our HERN website. Next slide. This, again, at hernnetwork.org. And here's the resource browser. If you click on resources, and you can go through. We're trying to tag special sets of interest now that uh, you can look at, such as tested insulin antibodies. And there's over a 1,000 resources here, so please do take a look. And at the end of his talk, Dr. Brem is going to show you and tell you about his protocols and other resources that he will have has available on the, the network browser, the resource browser as well. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Brem and we look forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joyce, for that kind introduction. And it's really exciting to be here today to talk a little bit about how our laboratories in collaboration with a, a number of other laboratories are exploring humanized mouse models for diabetes and even going beyond that to other autoimmune diseases and other aspects of human biology. I first would just like to thank the Hearn team who helped put all this to get together, specifically Layla, who were just great and instrumental in terms of getting the talks organized and putting together the resource resources that are we'll be talking about at, towards the end of the talk. So this work involved a number of collaborators for us here at UMass, including our co-directors, Dale Greiner and David Harlan at the Diabetes Center at UMass, and our good friends and long-term collaborators at the Jackson Laboratories, including Lenny Schultz, who has pioneered the use of humanized mouse models in a variety of contexts, and Jim Keck, who works at Sacramento West, Jax West. So 
As Joyce indicated, what I'll be doing today is, is first giving you a basic overview for humanized mouse models, describing the specific strains that we're using and some of the new strains that are coming up, becoming available to ask basic questions about human biology. Then I'll move to just basically describing some of the models that we and other laboratories use to study human pancreatic beta cells, to study human immunity, and some of the cool models now that we're actually putting these together to study the interactions of human immune systems with human beta cells. So where I like to start these talks is with a, basically my definition of a humanized mouse. And this is pretty simple, but it's important. So we, I basically consider these immunodeficient mice that are engrafted with human cells, tissues, immune systems, tumors, in such a way that these cells and tissues survive the engraftment process. But more importantly, can be uh, these cells and tissues will maintain overall functionality. We view this as a preclinical bridge between work done on the bench and the laboratory to work done in the clinical setting. Now, there are a number of applications of humanized mouse models in biomedical research. And these are kind of displayed here, ranging from regenerative medicine, the study of hematological disorders, again, important for diabetes work is studying pancreatic beta cell biology. There's a lot of work done in infectious disease and basic immunology. One of the hottest applications of these humanized mouse models is in studying cancer biology and looking at immunotherapies. And the final area, which will be the focus of a significant portion of today's talk, are using these humanized mouse models to study autoimmunity. And actually, this is proven to be one of the more challenging aspects for humanized mouse models. It's proven very difficult to get robust, strong models to study human autoimmune disease in these immunodeficient mice. But as I'll show you today, I think we're getting really close to having high throughput, very effective models that reproduce the biology of human autoimmune disease. So the overall goal is to study human-specific diseases, infections, and therapies without, without putting patients at risk. And if you take one thing away from my talk today is to remember that there's no perfect humanized mouse models. There's a variety of models that are available in terms of engraftment, strain background, strengths, and weaknesses, and we'll cover some of that. But it's really critical that you select the appropriate model for your experimental studies and what you want to do. So how do we actually engraft human immune systems into mice? Well, you needed to target both the mouse innate and adaptive immune system. And just to take a step back, I wanted to remind everybody what the, the immune response looks like to anagenic challenges. This really occurs in two waves. The first is the innate response to an anagenic challenge. And this includes xenogenic transplantation, such as human cells into mice. This includes a general inflammation by a variety of innate immune cells like dendritic cells, macrophage, mast cells, eosinophils, and neutrophils, and also a population of cells known as innate lymphoid cells. And one of my favorites are the natural killer cells uh, in terms of these ILCs. NK cells are actually really critical for humanization processes because because these natural killer cells are exquisitely good at killing non-self tissues, including human tissues that are engrafted into mice. Now, if the innate immune response is appropriate and strong enough, this will prime the way for the adaptive immune response, which is comprised of T cells and B cells. Uh, which are antigen specific, start out at a very low level, respond to the antigenic challenge to uh, higher levels to hopefully control whatever the pathogen burden is or whatever the antigenic burden is, and then go on to form long-term memory, and which is the basis of, of vaccines in our work. So to really get efficient engraftment of human immune cells into immunodeficient animals, you need to target both the native immune cells and we think primarily NK cells in our mouse models. And this really all began with mouse models that lacked an adaptive immune system, those T cells and B cells, and began in earnest with the CB17 skid mice. So many of you know the skid mutation is within the catalytic domain of a DNA activated protein kinase that is essential for double-stranded DNA repair. With this mutation, you no longer get those T cells and B cells to develop. Uh, they can be a little leaky as they age, but for most applications, skid mice are adaptive immune system deficient. So CB17 skid animals will support the engraftment of a wide variety of human cells and tissues. However, in many instances, this level of engraftment is very low. And, and with respects to immune system engraftment, the level of functionality is just very, very low as well. That low level engraftment and low level function is really attributed to the residual mouse innate immune system, including natural killer cells. So a next step that Lenny and Dale did back in 95, along with a number of other groups, was to take the skid mutation and cross it on to the non-obese diabetic mouse background, creating the nod skid animals. 
Nod skid mice rapidly became the gold standard for human immune system and human other kinds of human tissue engraftment. And actually, the Nod background offers a number of genetic adva advantages for this humanization process, including a reduced number and functionality of the natural killer cells, defects in the maturation of function of dendritic cells and macrophages, and these animals lack hemolytic complement due to the deletion of C5. In addition, Nod animals have a polymorphism and signal regulatory protein alpha that makes a more hospitable environment for humanization processes to occur. So SERP alpha is expressed by a variety of phagocytic cells and engages this ligand CD47. The Nod polymorphism in SERP alpha engages very strongly with CD, CD47, sending a strong don't eat me signal to those NOD mouse phagocytic cells. And this is different than a variety of other strains. So this Nod polymorphism is really essential for humanization. So while these nod skid animals will engraft with a variety of human cells and tissues, still with many aspects, specifically the immune system, the level of functionality can still be relatively low, hard to do robust studies of the immune system in these animals in, in a variety of contexts. In addition, nod skid animals have a lifespan of anywhere from 9 to, to 11 months due to developing thymic lymphomas that are IL-2 dependent because of an endogenous retroviruses. So the next step, which Lenny and Dale did with the Nod skid animals, was to introduce the IL-2 receptor comma gamma chain, again, along with a, lot, a variety of other groups introducing this comma gamma chain onto the background. Lenny also took a Nod rag deficient animal, which also disrupts T and B cell generation, and added on the comma gamma chain, creating the Nod rag comma gamma chain deficient mouse. So why the IL-2 receptor comma gamma chain? Well, this gamma chain is a component of high affinity cytokine signaling complexes for a number of cytokines that are critical for hematopoiesis. So just by targeting this single comma gamma chain, you disrupt high affinity signaling for IL-2, 4, 7, 9, 15, and 21. And just by itself, this, uh, this defect leaves severe defects in both adaptive and innate immunity. It's also the most common form of human X-linked skid disease. This is David Vetter, who had a comma gamma chain deficiency was severely immunodeficient. So now we have NSG and NRG mice that our labs use on a regular basis. These mice have a complete absence of the comma gamma chain, a complete deletion. They have a long lifespan, and this is due to the lack of IL-2 dependent thymic lymphomas. Remember with that comma gamma chain deficiency, we, we delete IL-2 signaling. They have further impairments, impairments and innate immunity. And probably the most important that we think is a complete absence of the mouse natural killer cells due to the absence of IL-15 signaling, which is critical for NK cell development and functionality. So NRG mice, NSG and NRG mice will engraft at very high levels with human cells, tissues, and immune systems, and support the engraftment of a wide variety of tissues, including human tumors, human skin grafts, pancreatic islets, and some of our modified models that Lenny has created with engrafting human hepatocytes. You can grow ES cells, IPS cells, and their differentiated products in these animals. We've engrafted human adipose tissue, human skeletal muscle, and we can graft human immune systems either by injection of hematopoietic stem cells or mature human immune cells. Now, while my lab pretty much exclusively uses NSG and NRG mice, we, there are a, a number of other models that can be used for humanization. So this is an outline for the major strain platforms of immunodeficient mice that will accept human cells and tissues. We've already talked about these two, the NSG and NRG animals. There are also NOG mice, which are similar to the NSG, but of a truncated version of the comma gamma chain, uh, developed by, in Japan by the Central Institute for Experimental Animals and distributed by Taconic. There's the NCG animal, which used CRISPR to introduce the skid mutation and the comma gamma, cha comma gamma chain mutation onto the NOD background that are commercially available from Jackson Laboratories. And there are a variety of other NOD background strains uh, from a number of the other sources. This is an, one example that used talent technology to introduce this skin mutation and the comma gamma gene mutation. There are also immunodeficient strains on a variety of other strain backgrounds, including Bob C backgrounds and B6 backgrounds. The problem with all these other backgrounds, as opposed to nods, is that polymorphism is in signal regulatory protein alpha. And none of these other strains, just at their base level, will engraft as well as a nod based strain. So a number of groups introduced changes into that axis of SERP alpha CD47 signaling. For example, Marcus Mann and Richard Favell introduced a human SERP alpha onto their Bob Rat comma gamma chain animal. And this is actually the basis of the mystery G mouse developed by uh, Richard, which has a heightened innate immune system development. Uh, groups that have uh, 
Hergen Spitz and Jim DeSanto introduced a nod SERP alpha onto their Bob Rad gamma, ch gamma chain background, again, enhancing engraftment. And the Rocky Mountain National Laboratories, Kim Hasselkrug, knocked out CD47 and also alters this don't eat me signal process and to the B6 rad comma gamma chain background, giving you a model that can now engraft. So a variety of these models can be used. They all support human engraftment as long as you can modify that SERP alpha CD47 engagement process. In addition, it's really just the three NOD models which are commercially available here in the US. So we have our NSG and NRG mice and they're good for a variety of applications. But we've been working with Lenny up at the Jackson Laboratories to develop what we consider a toolbox of humanized mouse models for a wide variety of human, human studies in vivo. So this in includes creating models of autoimmunity. We've been primarily focused on type 1 diabetes, but we're expanding out to others. So we have models which will allow us to more uh, better able to study pancreatic beta cell biology. We have HLA transgenic animals for presentation to autoreactive T cells. For example, Lenny has created HLA-A2 transgenics along with a wide variety of others. And he has a variety of class two trans transgenics, including HLA-DR4, DR3, and DQ8. Lenny has also expressed a number of autoantigens in these immunodeficient backgrounds, including human insulin. He's continuing to create models that have reduced mouse innate immunity. He's deleted mouse MHC, and we'll talk a little bit about that model, but he has a variety of other models which will dampen down the mouse immunity. He's made a, a NSG nude mouse by targeting FOXN1 and a variety of other mutations to dampen down innate immune responses. And he's introduced the W41 mutation onto this NSG mouse, which is in CKIT, the receptor for stem cell factor, and reduces the need for irradiation when you engraft hematopoietic stem cells. We're also looking at ways to enhance human innate immune systems. And there are a variety of human study kind transgenic models for this. There's the NSG SGM3 mouse, the CSF1 mouse, a mouse expressing IL-15, mice expressing flip 3 ligand, and then he's also made a complement sufficient mice, mouse. And there's also a variety of other study kinds transgenics on other backgrounds, including the Mr. G, which improves human innate immunity. And then the final aspect for these mice, and I, I think this is still a process we're trying to figure out, is to enhance B cell functionality. The majority of B cells in almost all of these humanized mouse models have an immature phenotype, and it's really difficult to get class switching to occur. So there's been a, a, a variety of approaches to be able to improve this. Uh, we think we can potentially correct the maturation defects by expressing cytokines such as BLISS and IL-6. And another aspect for these models, they have fairly limited lymph node and germinal center development. And there are a variety of models emerging for this, including the expression of IL-7 and TSLP. So what can we do right now to study di type one diabetes in our humanized mouse models? So our goal is really to study human beta cells from type one diabetic individuals in real life, real life settings where they can be, interact with intact type one diabetic immune systems. And this is really critical, not only for the immune system, but also from the beta cell and islet perspective. This is a uh, image from one of Al Power's papers from 2005, looking at a mouse islet compared to a human islet, looking at hormone producing cells. And you can see there, not only are there just functional and metabolic differences, even structural differences between the well-organized mouse islet compared to a kind of a disorganized human islet. And we want to take all of these factors into consideration when we start to study human type one diabetes and having human islets or human beta cells, I think would be really critical. So we're developing a number of models to study human beta cell biology, where you can study beta cell function, proliferation, beta stem progenitor and progenitor cells for replacement therapies and study islet transplantation and allograft rejection. That's on the beta cell side. On the immune cell side, we want to be able to evaluate the response of human islets to environmental perturbance and inflammation, be able to humanize these animals with hematopoietic stem cells, PBMCs, peripheral blood mononuclear cells, spleen cells, T cell clones with type 1 diabetics, and see how they function in vivo and how they interact with human islets. And ultimately, we'd be able to we really want to be able to recreate human type 1 diabetes in these mouse models. So what I'm gonna focus on first are just describing some of the models that we've created to study human beta cell biology. And there are a variety of ways which we can do this. So the first thing you do is study human beta cells in normal glycemic models, which is NSG and energy mice that we've already talked about. But Lenny has actually made a variety of hyperglycemic models where you can study human islets going in if they can regulate 
mouse blood glucose levels and how they respond to a variety of treatments. These include NSG and NRG mice, which have the Akita mutation, which is a single amino acid change in the insulin uh, two allele of the mouse, which causes misfolding, ER stress, and beta cell apoptosis. And usually within four to five weeks, all both male and female Akita animals return on hyperglycemic. Then he's also made an NSG rip DTR mouse. So it's a rat insulin promoter driving the human diphtheria toxin receptor, which you can treat with diphtheria toxin and then turn all of the mice hyperglycemic. So we, now we have models of spontaneous hyperglycemia and inducible hyper hyperglycemia. And while I'm not focusing on this today, Lenny's actually made a number of NSG models which can create an insulin resistant state, including leptin deficient and leptin receptor deficient animals, as well as GLUT4 deficient mice. So using a variety of these contexts, we and others have done human islet transplants into these hyperglycemic immunodeficient mice. Uh, and hyperglycemia can be used in a variety of ways. These mice are sensitive to streptozotism treatment, although it can be tricky. Uh, it takes a lot of optimization to get this to work. Uh, you have the spontaneous and the inducible models for hyperglycemia. This is just showing some experiments in energy Akita mice and grafted with human islets. This will be 4,000 human islet equivalents. These were put into the spleen, but you can also do them subrenally under the kidney capsule. And then looking at blood glucose levels over time, you see all the animals start out hyperglycemic. They rapidly correct, and euglycemia is maintained long-term in these animals' human islets. And for mice that you remove the graft-bearing kidney by nephrectomy, you see they all shoot up, indicating that's really the, the graft-bearing kidney, the islets, which are maintaining euglycemia in these animal models. So this is a great platform just to look at human islets, beta, beta cells derived from stem cell progenitors, and how they can go in and function in vivo and potentially respond to a variety of therapies. And I just highlighted this paper. This is from Al Powers Group and was done in collaboration with Dale Greiner and Lenny Schultz, but basically looked at the impact of tacrolimus and serolimus on beta cell functionality of human islets in vivo. So here they took NSG animals, implanted human islets under the kidney capsule, and then they treated with tac or ser or consaline as a control and analyzed overall functionality of those islet grafts. And he found some interesting aspects. So when you treat in vivo with tac or serolimus, you get dysfunctional beta cells after surgeries. And this includes reduced beta cell granules, reduced overall insulin production, and increase of amyloid levels within those islets that have been transplanted. Luckily, this is reversal. When they withdrew the immune suppression, either the TAC or the RAPA, they were able to restore functionality. And they actually had some data suggesting that co-treatment with the GLP-1 receptor agonist would actually prevent, to some level, the impact of TAC release and RAPA on the beta cells. So you can imagine a whole variety of aspects where, again, using either cadaveric pancreatic islets or beta cell derives from stem cells, going in and testing the, the response to a variety of therapies in an in vivo living situation. So the next aspect for this is how do we engraft human immune systems into these animals? And there are a variety of ways which you can do this. And each one of the approaches has strengths and weaknesses. And it's really critical to understand what those are before you start doing your experimental studies, you can select the wrong model that won't give you any kind of real data sets. So the first is what we refer to as the Hugh PBL skid mice. These are basically immunodeficient mice that are injected with human peripheral blood mononuclear cells, or, or PBMCs. So this is really the easiest model to establish. You need a donor to come in or, or purchasing PBMCs, isolate and enrich those PBMCs by density sensitive fluidation, and then you can just inject these at, inject PBMCs into our mice, either by intravenous or even intra intraperitoneal injection. And you get rapid engraftment of high levels of human immune cells in the periphery and of these animal models. The primary cell population which engrafts in these mice are gonna be T cells. Your B cells for the most part and your innate immune cells tend to die off within the first two days. So this is really just a, a model to study what we think human effector T cells in this in vivo setting. Potential downside for this model is that as the mice age with, the human, with these engrafted human T cells. The T cells will respond to the mouse MHC antigens and will mediate a xenogenetic graft versus host disease, which will kill the mice. So this is really a short-term model to study effector T cell responses. The other advantage for the system is it's relatively straightforward to get clinically relevant specimens from, for example, type one diabetic donors. We also work with PBMCs from cancer patients as well and graft them into the animals and study their overall functionality. The next model is what we refer to as the Hugh SRC skid mouse. 
So SRC stands for skid repopulating cells, which are basically CD34 positive hematopoietic stem cells. In this model are immunodeficient mice that have been in most cases sublethally irradiated, or as I mentioned previously with this W41 mutation, new models are becoming available that do not require radiation for engrafting with these hematopoietic stem cells. The HACs for this can come from a variety of, of sources, including umbilical core blood, GCSF mobilized peripheral blood, bone marrow aspirates, and even fetal liver for engrafting. The advantage of this system is you grow more of a complete human immune system where you get T cells, B cells, and innate immune cells. But it is important to note that B cell functionality is reduced in these animals again. And again, that the functionality of your innate immune cell populations is less than ideal. Even though they're present, their maturation and functionality levels are a little bit lower uh, in these HCC and grafting mice. A potential additional disadvantage for this model is that the majority of the T cells are being educated in the mouse thymus, and we think being selected on mouse MHC. So that does create some complications in terms of how those T cells are interacting with the human B cells and human innate immune cells. The final model is the bone marrow, liver, and thymus model, which was based on the original skid humouse uh, that was developed by Irv Weissman, Lenny Schultz, and Mike McTune. So in these animals, we take, we engraft human fetal liver and thymus under the renal capsule, and we inject autologous fetal liver cells. These animals probably grow the most robustly in grafting human immune system. And importantly, we have a growing human thymus, which enables very good T cell development with effect, effector conventional T cells, as well as regulatory T cells. And it can be used for a variety of aspects to study infectious disease, and other aspects of immune cell functionality. Potential disadvantage for this model is that over time, we will start to see a breakdown of peripheral tolerance. And we think the T cells start to respond to the mouse antigens, kind of limiting the lifespan of these animals. Generally, after screening, you have about 12 weeks to use these animals in your experiments. The other limitation for this is it does require fetal tissues. Other a variety of groups are trying to use stem cells to grow thymus to make this model more complete. So again, Strengths and weaknesses for all of these model systems, and it's important to keep those in mind whenever you start to do humanized mouse experiments to look at human immune systems. So what I'm gonna do next is, is basically look at a closer look at each one of these three models and give you a little more detail for how we engraft and some of the new aspects we're, we're developing for these models. So here we have our PBMC engraftment model, which again can be done in a variety of immunodeficient strains. You can include this with or without a radiation preconditioning and then we standardly do intravenous injection of 10 to the 6, 10 million human PBMCs. These can also be done by intra IP injection as well. And the graph mechanics are pretty similar, just maybe slightly slower with IP, but still pretty close. You then can follow them for human immune system graph and disease. Disease is characterized by hair loss, erythema, hunched posture, weight loss, ultimately death. And this is really that xenogenetic graph versus host disease that develops as the T cells respond to the mouse. So this is just showing you some of the kinetics for survival after PBMC injection. If we only irradiate the animals, in this case, using two, two grays in our NSG animals, you see you have long-term survival. This is one of the important aspects to consider for the humanized mouse strain you're selecting to use. Skid mice are much more sensitive to DNA damage. So if you use too high of a dose of irradiation on an NSG animal, you will kill all the animals because of that dose. Rag mice are much more resistant to radiation. So NRG mice can tolerate much higher levels of irradiation. Really important to consider if you are irradiating or using DNA damaging drugs. If you only inject in PBMCs, in this case using 10 million, you can see you have GVHD onset, but can be a little bit variable between, between donors and then even with the same donor. Usually with mice shown GVH anywhere between four to eight weeks. If you combine irradiation plus PBMC injection, you now really reduce a lot of the variability with all the animals in grafting and developing graft versus host disease within two to three weeks. So depending on your experimental question, you have to decide if you want a slower disease process or a short disease process. So for example, if you're testing T cell suppressive immunotherapies where you can slow down graft versus host disease, you might want to irradiate and give you more of a consistent readout for your graft versus host disease process. And as I mentioned, you get really, this is looking in the blood at two weeks post humanization you have nice levels of human immune cells in these animals, and the bulk of the cells in the peripheral blood are gonna be human T cells. So given that all of these mice are getting graft versus host disease, and this, that the kinetics of that process really depend on the number of cells that you inject. If you get fewer cells, 
It's a slower process. If you get more cells, it's a, it's a faster process. But we're looking at ways that we, get, we can actually reduce the XenoGVHD in their PBL skid model. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, the majority of human cells within NSG mice injected with human PBMCs are T cells. So I hypothesized that mice lacking mouse MHC will have reduced susceptibility to XenoGVH. So Lenny, again up at JAX, has made a variety of models which lack MSC class two, which signals the CD4 T cells, and mice that lack MSC class one, both a, a beta 2M knockout and a heavy chain KBDB knockout, which engages CD8 T cells. And both of these on their own slow down the graft versus host disease development when you inject in human PBMCs, but the mice still get sick. So what Lenny ultimately did was to take the class two knockouts and add on the MHC class one knockouts, creating MHC, mouse MHC double knockouts. And these show a, a significant reduction in the kinetics of the acute graft versus host disease. So here we're looking at NSG mice that were in, injected IP with 10 million PBMCs, no irradiation in this case, looking at straight NSG mice in the black line, NSG mice with the heavy chain knockout on class two deficiency in the red, and a beta 2M knockout in blue with a class two deficiency. The NSG mice get sick with similar kinetics that we've seen previously. However, our class one, class two knockouts, our MSC DKOs, have an extended lifespan in these animals. So now we've taken a model system which usually gets sick you know, within anywhere from four to eight weeks. And now these can go well past 100 days to give you a much longer time frame to do your experimental studies. We also know that these are actually grafting very well with human T cells, uh, slightly lower than the NSG, but still in a graft level to do your experimental studies on those human T cell populations. So we've actually been using this model to study human islet rejection, again, in the absence of the xenogenetic graft versus host disease process. So to do this, Lenny actually took his MAC double, double knockout mice and added on his rip DTR allele. So this gives us the ability to treat with diphtheria toxin, make the mice hyperglycemic, and then inject in human T cells and not get the graft versus host disease. So here we're looking at blood glucose levels over time. If we just take our NSG rip DTR mice, treat them with the diphtheria, diphtheria toxin, all of the mice turn hyperglycemic within four days at a, at a significant level. Then when you implant human islets, the, as long as the islets are of a good source and a good quality, the mice will correct our hyperglycemic state. And if you do nothing else, as you can see in these black lines here, the mice maintain euglycemia for a long period of time. However, if you co-engraft human PBMCs that are not matched to those islets, so allogeneic PBMCs being engrafted, these human islets are then rejected and the mice turn to a hyperglycemic state. So not only are we causing a, a longer term survival with this class one, class two knockout NSG model, we know that the T cells coming in are functional and can mediate the rejection of an islet's allograft. So the next model is our Hugh SRC skid mice. And just to talk a little bit of how we engraft in human immune cells into these animals, we generally use young mice, either one to three day old pups or 21 to 28 day old NSG mice. For the pups, we standardly do either facial vein, intracardiac or intrahepatic injection for engraftment. And for our older animals, we either do tail vein injections, that's our general protocol, or we even park those hematopoietic stem cells into the femur of these animals. Our basic protocol is to do low dose whole body radiation, 100 centigrades, if you're using NSG mice, it's higher if you're using NRG or other rag background animals. We then use CD34 positive cells from CD3 depleted umbilical cord blood, and we generally inject in about 100,000 cells, but you can probably go with lower levels. But we found that the 100,000 gives us a more consistent engraftment across all the mice. If we look at the kinetics for human cell lineage development, and these are shown as a proportion of CD45, you see early on, you primarily have CD33 myeloid cells in red and B cells in black. The T cells take a little bit longer to come up. And generally, if we're engrafting three week old NSG mice, we get reasonable T cell levels between 15 to 18 weeks after injection of our hematopoietic stem cells. So if you're using newborn mice, shown here, the one to three day old pups, T cell development's a little bit faster, usually with usable levels of T cells between 12 to 15 weeks, and basically this is all due to the timing of age. The older the animal, usually the slower the T cells develop. And we think this it really all comes down just to the 
overall structural integrity of the thymic tissue, which is better in the younger animals. The advantage of using these three to four week old animals is just a little bit more robust after humanization, easier injection process compared to doing a facial vein on a newborn. And then the final model is our BLT mouse model, which again, we use uh, fetal tissues where we take small fragments of fetal liver and fetal thymus. These get engrafted under the kidney capsule of mice that have been sublethally irradiated. And simultaneously, we're isolating CD34 positive cells, which can be injected intravenously into these animals. As I mentioned, these animals grow a functional human thymic organoid. It's looking at the structure at 16 weeks. Remembering that we started with a one millimeter fragment of tissue. We now have a uh, thymic organoid that's almost the same size as the kidney. If you evaluate the thymocytes within these grafts by sitting with human CD4 and CD8, uh, we have the standard uh, hierarchy of thymocytes within the thymus with a small proportion of double negatives, a big population of double positives, and the mature single positive cells just ready to immigrate out into the periphery. If you look in the peripheral blood of these animals, again, at 16 weeks, we have very nice levels of human CD45 and immune cells in the peripheral blood. You can find CD3 positive T cells, CD20 positive B cells. And from these T cells, you can find both CD4s and CD8s. If you look more specifically at the CD4 T cell population, you can also find nice levels of human regulatory T cells. And you can find innate immune cell populations as well. Here we're looking at monocytes in the peripheral blood, which are CD14, CD33 positive. And you can also find 11C positive uh, C or MDCs, as well as CD123 positive PDCs. So you can find these populations and they are functional. But again, as I mentioned previously, in the standard mouse models without additional cytokines, they're not completely optimized for maturation or functionality. So that kind of gives you an overview of where we're at with models for beta cell engraftment, as well as immune system engraftment. But what we really want to do is to leverage these humanized mouse models in a variety of contexts, but really be able to build a better model of human type 1 diabetes. And there's a couple key components that we think we need to build this model. So the first, of course, are the pancreatic beta cells, the targeted immune response, probably playing a role in the induction of disease. But you need a pretty robust source of mature beta cells, which can be challenging. The next component, of course, is the immune system. They immediate the autoimmune disease process. Uh, the process involves both innate and adaptive immune cells. Uh, and what we need to study human type 1 diabetes in theory are hematopoietic stem cells or PBMCs from type 1 diabetic individuals, which you can get, but again, there's actually a, a limited resource. And the final aspect is the thymus, which is critical for education and development of T cells. We know it selects against high affinity auto reactive T cells. But again, you need a source of mature thymic tissue, ideally from someone of a diabetic predisposition. So all of these can be, can be obtained, but getting key reagents that will have a type one diabetic genetic profile is the challenge. So this is what our group has been doing to be able to reconstruct human type one diabetes using stem cells to create beta cells, thymic epithelium, and hematopoietic stem cells. So we're working with Dave Harlan here at UMass to consent a variety of type 1 diabetic and non-diabetic donors in the clinical setting here, the clinical division at UMass. Blood specimens are then shared with Doug Melton's laboratory at Harvard, where Doug is creating IPS cells from his type 1 diabetic and non-diabetic individuals. He then shares those cells with other laboratories, with his laboratory making stem cell derived beta cells, Renee Mayer's lab here at UMass making thymic epithelium, and George Daly's lab making hematopoietic stem cells from the same diabetic donors and non-diabetic donors. We then work with Lenny to engraft these, these cell populations into mice. And Lenny has created a wide number of these unique mouse strains, which gives us a, a pretty unique perspective to be able to study each one of these cell populations either individually or together, including our W41, where we can graft the stem cells without irradiation, the NSG nude mouse, which you can test thymic epithelial function because these mice lack their thymus, I've already mentioned the RIP DTR, MHC double knockout. And one of the cooler models I think that's going to be very exciting is Lenny has made a FLIP3 ligand transgenic with a mouse FLIP3 null mutation, which actually shows really strong profiles for developing human innate immune cells and adaptive immune cells. So I'm working with Dale Greiner to engraft a variety of these cell products into a variety of our NSG mouse strains. And then working with Sally Kent here at UMass and Dave Harlan to characterize T1D Type the development of diabetes 
as well as the human T cell populations within these animals. While we made significant progress in these, we're still optimizing the development of thymic epithelium and hematopoietic stem cells. So in, as those continue to be optimized, we're actually doing real experiments with the pancreatic beta cells from type one diabetic individuals right now, where we can engraft in those pancreatic beta cells derived from iPS cells into our immunodeficient mouse strains, primarily using our NSG MSC double knockout mice. And then we can take blood either from the autologous or matched donor, in theory, to be able to recreate type one diabetes or PBMCs for non-matched or allogeneic donors. Look at the allo response against these pancreatic beta cells. So these studies are actually ongoing and hopefully we'll have some really nice data to share at our next HERN meeting for both the induction of autoimmunity and the allograft rejection of these. But I do wanna mention a paper that just came out this fall, which used the Hugh PBR skid model in NSG SGM3 mice. And this came from Ron Evans, Ron Evans laboratory, where he took stem cell derived beta cells and grafted them into these animals and showed that non-matched allogeneic responses would reject these cells. And that if you express PDL1 on these beta cells, that actually would abrogate rejection. So I think you're gonna see a lot more of these studies coming out, but how we can modulate these beta cells in, in terms of making them less susceptible to immune recognition and, and rejection. There are a number of other groups working on these type one diabetic models to understand more, can we create true models of diabetes? And can we use these models, leverage them to ask other questions about the functionality of immune systems and beta cells? So this is a recent study from the group at Columbia led by Megan Sykes, in which they generated a, a type one diabetic model where they can study type one diabetes in humanized mice. For this, they used actually an NSG mice mouse expressing HLA-DQ8. They engrafted an infecal thymus and liver from a DQ8 donor, humanized their animals, and then they could take CD4 T cells from some of those transduce in an autoreactive T cell receptor, put those back into the animals and give some additional treatments. And they actually found they could induce some diabetes. And in this case, it's the human immune system that's DQ8 restricted, that's meeting the destruction of islets in a DQ8 transgenic. These are mouse islets that are being destroyed. So you can see you get a nice level of diabetes development in mice that were transduced, or CD4 cells that were injected back in with autoreactive T cell receptor. And if you actually look at those islets, you can see very few yellow insulin positive cells and a lot of glucagon positive red cells here. And you can actually find green immune cells that are homing around those destroyed islets, CD3 positive T cells. So an exciting model that I think is, uh, will set some precedent in terms of developing systems to study a true autoimmune recognition, in this case of mouse islets. The Columbia group has also done, developed a number of models which they can study the selection of human T cells in vivo on a human thymus, which I think is really important to be able to study that negative and positive selection of autoreactive human T cells in vivo. The first model, uh, the most recent, which came out in, in 2019, was really looking at MART1 specific CD8 T cells where they were able to add in MART1 specific peptide and study how those now autoreactive MART1 cells developed. They also did a similar aspect with the, their DQ8 transgenic animal looking at selection of autoreactive CD4s. And just one final thing, these models are actually being used quite regularly to test protective immunity, uh, protective devices, both micro and macro encapsulation for either human islets, or in this case, from the UCSF HERN group, uh, stem cell derived beta cells, which were put into this nanoporous immunoprotective protective device, loaded in and grafted into animals and showing that you maintain functionality of those cells in vivo. And now experiments are underway to really assess if these will protect against autoreactive and allogeneic immune, human immune responses in vivo. So again, just to kind of summarize, it's important to remember that there are a variety of these humanized mouse strains available. So again, it's a critical to, to think about your scientific question and make sure you're selecting the appropriate strain for humanization that will give you the best chances to be successful in your experimentation. And just to end again, uh, you know, the HERN is building this resource browser link, which opens up the upper opportunity to be able to look at a variety of protocols that are being developed by HERN groups. Uh, we recently uploaded uh, a CD34 hematopoietic stem cell engraftment model into this browser. So if you want to see the details, including how to order a, a variety of the reagents 
antibodies, other aspects for how to create a CD34 humanized mouse model. You can go to this link up here and be able to look at that as well as, well as a wide variety of other models. And this is just to acknowledge everyone that contributes to this work, uh, including the Hearn as one of our, our primary funders. Also, we have a great faculty here at the DCOE, a number of technicians, postdoc, and graduate students contributing to the work. And I'd just like to acknowledge again, Lenny up at the Jackson Laboratories, our collaborators at the Harvard Stem Cell Institute, Doug and George, Al Powers, who's been a great collaborator at Vanderbilt, and we've done a lot of work with Roland Tisch at UNC. So I can, I can stop there and maybe open up for discussion. Excellent talk. Thank you, Mike, very much. Um, a few uh, questions have started coming into the chat already. Um, so let's start with those. And I have to open this up. Um, so one says, great talk. <clears throat> what would be the, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm trying, having trouble getting to it. Uh, what would be the difference, the survey popped up on me, the, the differences between the DTR and the STZ models, could the blood glucose, gotta scroll down, could the blood glucose levels in the RIP DTR model be finely tuned with different doses of toxins, e.g. low diphtheria dosage uh, versus high? Yeah, so there are, there are several differences, right? Um, so for, for strep treatment, it, it is kind of a challenging model. We know that male mice are much more sensitive to strep treatment. Female mice are much harder to turn uh, with strep treatment. And there's a variety of aspects for the, making sure strep is, is optimal. Um, ideally, you would, we make, when we do a strep injection experiment, we're making up the reagent and we're injecting it as fast as we can, definitely within an hour of preparation. If you go longer, you definitely start to see decreasing efficacy of, of treatment. And it can be a little bit variable uh, between different injecting time points, uh, how efficient, efficiently we can turn mice hyperglycemic. We do, even in males, we can see one group of animals showing some pretty robust, where we get like 80, 90% of the mice turn hyperglycemic. And there'll be other times where we have a lower percentage. The DTR model, is very consistent. Male, female, low dose diphtheria toxin treatment turns almost all the mice hyperglycemic. Um, you probably can do a dosage kind of equilibrium where if you give a lower dose, you can get more of a moderate level of hyperglycemia. Give a higher dose, you can kill off all the beta cells. The, the one aspect for the DTR animal is that long term, you know, in the months down the line, you may start to see some regeneration. So if you're, as long as your experiments are two to three, maybe four months in length, you shouldn't see much regeneration in the DTR model. Great, um, thank you. Oh, are you ready for the next question? Or? Yeah. So is it, can we engineer a mouse that is sensitive to human insulin? So, you know, it's interesting. I mean, and maybe I didn't clearly explain that in, in the talk, but human insulin actually regulates mouse glucose levels. And it's really cool. When you transplant human islets into the animals, Usually the set point is lower. I mean, a, a mouse, their normal glucose levels are, you know, can be in non-fasting conditions, 150 up to 200, sometimes a little bit higher. But with human islets in the context there, the levels are usually 100 or below in a non-fasting state. And sometimes, depending on the number you put in, you can even see they even go lower than that, below 80 on a regular basis. So the mouse is actually very sensitive to human insulin. Um, of course, my cursor disappeared. See, can you share the slides? I think I, I'd be happy to share the slides. And I also think, uh, Layla, correct me if I'm wrong, this will be uh, <laughs> uh, on YouTube for a long period of time. Yeah. So, yeah. This webinar is being recorded on YouTube. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's in there. Good. Thanks. There's another question I was wondering do you have any idea about studying the beta cell regeneration in humanized mice, mouse model, especially for long standing diabetes? If you're talking about human beta cells, I think that's definitely something of, of interest. And uh, uh, one of our, our colleagues, Laura Alonzo, who used to be at UMass, is now at Cornell, has actually done a lot to look at beta cell proliferation and, and regeneration in hyperglycemic mice that were transplanted with human islets. So I think there's a, a lot that we can do to study aspects of normal human beta cell biology in these mouse models. 
All right, then we have another one. Can we use this humanized mice to develop vaccines against T1D? That's actually a, a, a great question. Um, and I think ultimately we're, we're gonna be able to do that. One of the downsides for these mouse models, at least currently, is proven pretty challenging to get robust adaptive immunity to vaccines in these mice. There are a few examples of where it might work at a lower level, but getting antigen-specific T cells and antigen-specific B cells in these models is a challenge. But I think right now, any kind of vaccine where you are, are gonna be trying to induce immunity is, is gonna, be, gonna be tough right now. But the good note is with all the new models that Lenny and, and a lot of other groups are creating, I'm, I'm really optimistic in the, in the near future, we're gonna have humanized mouse models which will give us consistent, robust, adaptive immunity following immunization. So great point. All right, so question. Hello, uh, my name is Golnaz Wahidi. I'm from UPenn, terrific talk. Thank you so much. I have a question. I don't know, it may sound naive and show that I'm missing something, but I thought I would ask in case somebody else might have it. So the background of NOD being used um, in the type 1 D diseases, uh, can other loci that are known to be to contribute to the disease uh, complicate the interpretation of the data? Like, I understand that this seems to be a best uh, model to, um, to use to really so, uh, exclude all the adaptive immune cells, but can you comment about uh, other loci that genetically have been found to be linked to type 1 D? Yeah, I think that's a great point. So the, the question is, is it an advantage to have those uh, if they correlate with human disease or could it be, could it be a disadvantage uh, with these models? And honestly, we don't, we don't really know. Um, and, and I think maybe part of the problem right now is that no one has, in my mind, a, a, you know, an easy to do robust model of diabetes in these humanized mice. The, Megan Sykes' group, that the little overview I gave you, that one paper, um, is probably the, the one that has the closest. But even that, that's a tough model, right? And it's engineered. So you know, we're working with a variety of groups trying to, to understand if, you know, my, my bet is that the nod background actually gives us an advantage for inducing type 1 diabetes. I don't know that for sure, but that's that's kind of the our, our assumption with this, as opposed to just trying to recreate diabetes in, in a B6 or a, a Bob C uh, mouse strain. Could be wrong on that. And again, many of these genetic dispositions are related to the immune system, but, but not all. So in, in many ways, I almost look if, you know, if we're, and other groups are working on this as well, using stem cells to get beta cells, immune cells, hematopoietic stem cells, and thymus. That I, I think may actually bypass some of the genetic genetics of the stromal system that's left for the immune system. And then another aspect for this is too, it's really critical to remember that at their best, these models are still, are still chimeras, right? So we still have aspects of the mouse immune system present here. So we can never forget there are some still mouse macrophages, dendritic cells, mast cells, granulocytes, which, you know, there, we do have models that can slow some of those down and a little bit slower on this background anyway, but they're still present. So, but definitely a good point and we don't know. <laughs> Hopefully it's, Thank you. it's a good thing. Um, so, Mike, there were, yeah. some, there were some early questions I think you missed. Let me direct you to those. One was from Jeff Eisenberg. He asks, does radiation change the CD47 SERP signal, either increase or decrease. Can you comment on that? Yeah, sorry, my uh, my cursor disappeared, so I'm kind of guessing where to scroll. Um, that's a, that's an interesting question. I, I don't know. Uh, I would anticipate, you know, my, my thought on that is the radiation dose is pretty low. I mean, at least for our, our NOD strains, the SKIDs, we're using 100 to 200 centigrades, sometimes 50 centigrades, depending on the model. Um, for the... The rag mice are more 400 to 500. So there's lower doses. I don't know how much they would change that. Um, and we also know we, in the W41 mice, we don't need a radiation, but we haven't, we really haven't looked at the importance of the CD47 SERP. I do know the mouse strains, you know, the, the bulbs, the B6s, you're gonna radiate those 
but they still don't have anywhere near the engraftment level that uh, nod background strain or one of those other strains that have kind of antagonized that CD47 stroke alpha axis. Okay. Um, There's another one. Let me draw that to you before you go down, Mike. Sure. Uh, this is from Sasanka Ramanadhan. And um, the question is, can you elaborate on the differences, advantages between the NSG and oh, yeah. The RG? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, John. Um, you know, they're very similar in, in a variety of aspects. Uh, you know, the skin mutation by itself can have, lead to a little bit of leakiness in T cells and B cells and, and without the common gamma chain. The rag mutation is more absolute but when you combine the skid plus the comma gamma chain mutation, there's no leakiness anymore. So there's no real differences in terms of engraftment, overall health, um, the diversity of engraftment that you can see. Really in, in our experience, the biggest difference is just sensitivity to DNA damage. And it's, it's actually pretty applicable to anybody doing cancer studies where you know, if using a, a DNA damaging agent, uh, the the skid mice can be pretty sensitive. You have to really be careful in dosing. The rag mice are generally more resistant. And also it's really important when you look at uh, doses of radiation. Um, if you give the wrong dose to your skid mouse too high, it's not gonna be good. But interestingly, if you give lower doses to your rags, you don't get the same level of engraftment. So no matter which one you choose, it's specific if you're engrafting immune systems, you may need to make sure that you're optimizing your preconditioning regime, whether it's for radiation or even something like busulfan. All right, so was that all the earlier ones, I think? It was, Mike. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so then there's another question that is, what is the maximum amount of stem cell derived beta cells that could be transplanted under the kidney capsule with respect to vascularization? Would you administer insulin to control hyperglycemia in the initial days? Yeah, great question. Um, sometimes these SC beta cell pellets are, are pretty big. We generally try to shoot for about 5 million cells from our SC beta cell transplant. And many times those pellets are, are quite sizable under the kidney capsule. We have also put some of these in intrasplenically as well, which is also a challenge because the spleen of these immunodeficient mice are usually so small, but you can go either way. Um, and I think the other problem you hit here is that in many cases, initially these stem cell derived beta cell products are not immediately functional. So the insulin they're producing uh, isn't enough to kind of regulate the glucose levels. So many times we will give them an insulin pellet just if, we're, if they're hyperglycemic, just to give them some time to, to allow those beta cells to become functional. So if you're transplanting stem cell derived beta cells into a hyperglycemic mouse, uh, maybe not so much the Akita because they can kind of self-regulate, but if you're using the strep or the DTR model, you probably should include an insulin pellet just to compensate for metabolic decompensation. Um, interestingly though, it, uh, our powers, again, in collaboration with Dale and Lenny, had done islet transplants into the NSG RIP DTR, let them go a little bit, and then came back in with diphtheria toxin, which killed off the diphtheria toxin expressing mouse beta cells. But if you give it that low enough, low enough dose, that does not impact the human beta cells. So that's also an option where you can let those cells mature over a little bit of time and then come in with diphtheria toxin to induce hyperglycemia. You just have to be careful not to give too high of a dose, which may impact your human beta cell function. Do we have any other questions? Anybody want to unmute and ask a question? Just about at time. Uh, I have a question actually uh, regarding the development of vaccine for type 1 diabetes. Uh, actually, we, we, we are able to, um, uh, to develop vaccine for type 1 diabetes and uh, for prevention and for reversal of uh, diabetes in NOD mice. But my, uh, until now, the using humanized mouse model, I don't know which one of, of these we can use uh, for a study of uh, if we can if we can just give some information about the 
uh, immune system or immune response against uh, immune response for for vaccine. What do you think? Which one of these can help? Um, yes, it's a tough question. Just you know, if the goal is to induce some kind of energy specific immune cell population, that's still a challenge. Uh, there are we already we already know this is antigen specific immune response, and this is actually we we already know this is antigen specific T regs. Uh, and also uh, like TR1 effect, and there is also some effect on the, uh, we, we, we are still working with this, but we know there is some preliminary data, there is sterogenic disease. So yeah, <laughs> but all yeah. this in, so, in animal model. Yeah, just, just it, I think, you, you, yeah, there is, there are some data, you know, for example, from Caroline Daniel, uh, she worked with, with Lenny, uh, in a, I believe, a DQ8 model, showing they could induce some uh, regulatory cells, uh, CD4 cells, with immunization. Mm -hmm. uh, I would just be careful in terms of, you know, how robust it is to induce antigen-specific responses in these mice. It's it's extremely challenging. So unless you have a, a real optimized mouse model or protocol, it's challenging. But again, right now. You know, there's not, I would say, easy models to study human type 1 diabetes in humanized mice. Uh, Megan's group probably has the closest one, but that one's, it's a challenge to model to, to create with, you know, requiring uh, lentibiotic transduction with TCRs, uh, strep treatment, immunization with peptide. So, and that's against hum, uh, mouse beta cells. So it's not, it's, and I think it's a promising model, but it's, it's a challenging one just to, to create and get up and running. Um, there's not, a, I would say, an easy model of type 1 diabetes yet. You can definitely do islets allograft rejection with humanized mice. But you know, as of now, getting a, a really robust type 1 diabetes model is, is what we're working for, working towards. Um, but there, there, that is a challenge. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brim. I think we're going to have to call it the hour now. Um, Dr. Brim's contact information would be on our website. And thank you all for attending and look for our webinar in July. We'll have another one um, next month. So we appreciate everyone attending and thank you very much for an excellent talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.